lose patience a little bit. But look, a huge thanks to all the folks here for, for joining today. It sounds like we've got people from, from far and wide. Uh, and a very big thanks to Materials Australia uh, and the local organisers for providing me the opportunity and the honour for the annual Gifkins lecture, um, perhaps for the first time virtually and hopefully for the last time virtually because it's usually nice to be doing it in person. Um, so like many of you, uh, I'm also in, in lockdown in Melbourne um, where we're sort of under a strict lockdown. So I hope uh, you're all keeping healthy and up Beat. Um, I've been unable to escape back to, to, to Canberra because of the, uh, the sort of strict uh, isolating conditions. Um, I too also want to pay uh, my respects to the traditional owners of the lands on, on which we meet, including their elders past and present. Um, I'm presently on Wurundjeri land, um, as denoted by some of the Wurundjeri symbols that you can see there on the right. And I'm going to do some acknowledgements, not at the start, but in the various sections uh, as we go. So look, the presentation today was touted as recent trends in materials design. I plan on sticking to that, but I know that technical presentations on, on Zoom um, can be hard work for all of us, especially for the audience. So in order to stimulate some thought and hopefully keep you engaged, I've broken up the presentation into a, a series of short stories. So there's about five of them and each of them is about five or six minutes. So, uh, so hopefully you find them amusing. Um, the first one of those um, uh, will be on, a, on, they're all on different facets of material science and engineering um, that will include glass, additively manufactured, aluminium alloys, just to keep it concise because additive manufacturing is very big, um, materials designed by machine learning and AI, some green materials and some stuff uh, on superconductors, which is uh, not actually my work on superconductors, um, but that really seeks to, to wrap up the narrative. So. A little bit about me, my background. Um, I guess I got interested in metallurgy from quite young or fascinated in materials. This is a picture of my grandparents' uh, house. Um, and they were also cl clearly intrigued by metallurgy from a bygone era. So most of you see, the things you see in this picture are actually from the 17th and the early 18th century. Um, and this is actually the patio area. And unfortunately, the inside of the house is not much better. Um, My God. But, yeah, it's quite <laughs> remarkable. But look, um, like I even mentioned, um, I have worked in corrosion for around about uh, two decades. And my personal work has been focused on, on metals. Um, and I guess my background has always had to give the constant consideration of, of viewing materials a little bit differently because I always view them as having come from their maker, which is planet Earth. Um, but um, they also, in the context of corrosion, have to go back to their maker, which is also planet Earth. So my, my view of materials is very different to, to, to many others. If one goes back a couple of thousand years, um, unfortunately, there's no naturally occurring uh, steel mill. But instead, uh, what we actually have um, is we have forests, we have oceans, geological sites that allow us to extract metals from minerals uh, to unlock a range of, of, of the metals that we see in the periodic table. Now the periodic table is predominantly made up of metals, but essentially none of which uh, are naturally occurring in their metallic state, at least in some appreciable volume um, or abundance on this planet. So we need to make them and we need to engineer them. And the translation here uh, that you see on the screen from planet all the way through to an aircraft includes uh, folks like all of us on this call right through the middle uh, and an eye-watering amount uh, of energy, so much so that anthropogenic materials are known as being chiefly of environmental pollution. So uh, in my work with corrosion, I see this energy given back to mother nature every single day. Um, and that's the driving force for turning metals back to the ore and the non-metallic state. So this raises a question that I wanted to just put up there or a couple of questions before I put up there before I jump into my case studies of how can we be more sustainable um, because this process that you see here is highly energy intensive. How can we have materials that are, that are more durable? So my first example of materials design actually picks up from mother nature and has a little bit of a bent towards sustainability um, and it's on glass. So as all of us know, glass, for example, <laughs> windows and drinking glasses 
Um, you all know them, but some of you may not know this little gem, which is known as Venus's flower basket. Um, it's a deep sea sponge that's found in the vast depths of the Pacific Ocean. So not far from Australia. And here you can see one in the bottom right um, that's been formed at over two kilometers below sea level. And they're comprised completely of silica. Now, what's really interesting about them is that their, um, their microstructure was only characterized relatively recently because missions to retrieve these are quite complex. Um, but they're an archetypical multi-scale material with geometric features at the, at the macro scale right through to the nano scale, including the exploitation of layering the same material, um, geometric structures, and of course, um, free space. Um, but what's interesting about these things is that they've got a very complex structure. They've got about um, an 800 million year head start if you consider mother nature to be a materials designer from us. But the, the unique thing is that they're as strong as steel, which is remarkable, right? They're much lighter and they don't rust. Um, and you can see in these cool pics that are from the Vice Institute in Harvard, uh, that the glass structure is actually very remarkable right down to the to the nanostructure. So actually it turns out, hopefully some of you, it's interesting um, that essentially the same structure, but in different arrangements and length scales, you can see huge variation in properties from very brittle um, behavior of glass, like you see when you drop your vase or your vase at home um, to very, very tough. But in all cases, there's no grain boundaries. There's no crystal structure. It's the same, same and there's geometry dependent properties. So what I thought I'd do is show you a video of a bowling ball sized glass ball dropped from a massive height onto a bit of steel sheet. So I'm not sure if this is gonna work in your videos, but you may be able to hear it. This is actually uh, from the, the, the TikTok page from some Australian um, goofballs called At How Ridiculous, right? So. So I don't know if you could see the video through your screens. It will depend on your bandwidth. But that wailing that you heard at the end is, is that he said the ball is completely intact. So I'm not sure how many of you um, anticipated that to happen. Uh, oh, next one. This next video is actually one of mine. So a bit closer to home. You'll probably, some of you that play with glass will know that if you get it down to a length scale of under around about 20 microns, um, it's exceptionally flexible. Um, and tough, and, and it's almost to the point of just like cotton thread. Um, my daughter wanted me to tell everyone that she recorded this for me, and this is a couple of years ago. So one of the great mysteries is that um, the geometry dependent properties of an amorphous material are largely unknown in the field of material science. So why am I telling you that? Um, I thought this lecture is very important, I guess, uh, and I've always enjoyed these lectures over the last 20 years working in materials. Um, and why am I talking about glass in the Gifkins lecture? Well, materials are a critical part of, of our society globally, but also very locally. And, and when I mean locally for those in Victoria, I actually mean in your driveway. So next year, um, everyone's gonna get a purple lidded bin. I call it the purple party bin because it will be filled of, of remnants of your parties. I think if you can imagine it being full of wine bottles or whiskey bottles or whatever. Um, and uh, the reason why that's happening is because uh, exporting of waste to countries like China has stopped. So we have a big problem on our hand. And so your relationship with glass, whether you know it or not, is very intimate because if you think about how many times you throw away a glass item every week, I can probably bet you it's a lot more often than throwing away a titanium forging, which probably you don't have in your house and have never thrown away. So your relationship with glass is, is actually quite intimate. And why I'm telling you this is because we have a waste problem on our hands and we have a, a scientific gap on our hands in understanding how to turn glass into engineered uh, structures of, of quality mechanical properties. So what's being done about it? Well, luckily, there is a little startup company um, here in Melbourne, in Northcote, in an old Victorian building on the bottom right there, um, that's created the world's first commercial 3D uh, printer for glass that can geometrically uh, arrange glass, take a CAD file, turn it into something complex, um, and, and the feedstock is recycled garble like, uh, like, like wine bottles. 
And so this company is called Maple Glass Printing, which is very, very fascinating. Well, oh, someone said Nick. Was that yeah, you, Nick, Ivan? It's Ivan. Um, you're now the uh, the host, so yeah. sorry to interrupt, but could you go to oh, the... Oh, yeah, I can admit a couple of people there. Admit a couple of people, yes. I'll admit them all. Thanks, Ivan. And just jump in any time. All right, they're, they're, they've been admitted. So here you get to see some examples now of uh, CAD to product using glass on the top left. Which is, which is actually quite remarkable. In an example on the bottom right of infill, you're controlling free space to control properties. So this is a bit of a local innovation that you get to see here, which I thought might be, might be fitting for the Gifkins lecture. Um, while we're still talking about glass, um, what else can be done with waste glass? So interestingly, uh, a recent uh, student of mine called Guy Sander that just submitted his PhD uh, back at Monash, he was working on 3D printed stainless steel. Um, but we entertained the idea of adding glass waste, crushed glass waste powder um, into the selective laser melting process to make a stainless steel glass hybrid um, that's indeed lighter than, than stainless steel, cheaper and, um, and much, much lighter actually. Because if you think about the volume fraction of glass, um, when you've got 10 weight percent in there, the volume fraction is much bigger than, than 10 weight percent. And interestingly, um, this worked. Just, yeah, that worked. And what you can actually see there, and this worked for 25 weight percent glass too, which was um, nearly 50% volume fraction of glass. What you see on the left is an optical micrograph and the accompanying SEM images and EDX maps. And what looks to be pores on the left, if you look on the right, is actually a silicon rich phase. Um, and what's interesting here is that what looked like powdered form to be a lot of glass relative to metal is no longer. So what actually happened, very interestingly, what actually happened is it turned out the glass at the temperatures of selective laser melting alloyed with, with stainless steel and a new phase was formed and that's a silicon, iron, chrome, manganese, oxygen phase. So the reason why I'm telling you here is this was, this bigger study where there was corrosion work as well and so forth was, was, was just published last week. But the interesting thing here is that there's a lot of fun to be had with not just um, uh, waste materials like glass, but it's also showing us that there's a previously unreported and undiscovered phases sitting under our nose, which, which I have found um, month after month using additive manufacturing, the number of new phases that we've discovered um, is so many, and this is just one example of that. And I'll show you two more examples just through this this uh, um, this series of, of slides. All right, so that was the first short story on 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 glass. Um, I'm now going to talk a little bit about additive manufacturing, um, particularly of aluminium alloys, um, since I started talking about additive manufacturing just then anyway. And this picture here comes courtesy of, of Martin Jurg. Um, Wow. Thank you, Martin. Um, that shows the opportunities of using free space and geometric control in making items net shape. Right. So um, the production of net shapes components for aluminium alloys um, is particularly important because uh, aluminium alloys are usually very fussy with fabrication where we see situations like this. And this riveting is necessitated um, to retain heat treated so microstructures. To mute. Sorry, Dick. Can everybody uh, mute, please? Thanks, Thanks, Ivan. Ivan. Please mute everybody apart from Nick. All right, I can do that, Ivan. So I've just done that myself as the host. Thanks for that, Ivan. Alan, I can see your thumb though. Can you still hear me, Alan Morton? If you can hear me, that's great. Yeah. So look, um, not only is what we're seeing here not ideal, but it creates wonderful corrosion conditions that have that have helped be being been employed. But if we think about aluminium in net shape, um, it's going to be very critical for our future needs. So in particular, when we start to think about the materials requirements for commodification of a of, of flight for which the mass use of exotic alloys like nickel alloys, super alloys, even titanium alloys is not feasible. Um, net shape, lightweight, high strength components are going to be absolutely critical. And what you see here is not necessarily dreamed up, although it's not yet in production, but this is a concept called the Audi plus Airbus pop-up, um, which I think is a really, really fascinating thing. 
All right, so I would probably be criticized very heavily uh, for the Gifkins lecture if I didn't show some micrographs given the history of, of Robert Gifkin, Gifkins and, uh, and his love of microscopy of all forms. Here we see um, some uh, TEM micrographs of additively manufactured aluminium alloy 7075, which is the old faithful in Brightfield and Darkfield scanning, scanning TEM. What's really interesting here is that high magnification images that you can see here in Brightfield TEM of an ident identical uh, hardening uh, particle um, in the alpha matrix. Um, you can see that when you go through various zone axes, you get strong diffraction contrast. And the diffraction contrast you see exhibits a twofold, a threefold, and a fivefold symmetry of what's actually an icosahedral uh, quasi crystal. And the reason why this is actually quite interesting, of course, is uh, if you look a little bit closer uh, at this icosahedral quasi crystal, um, it's quite clear. And when you go through the process of, of uh, out of stem and then Fourier transforming your image, um, you can see that this is what's uh, been determined to be a previously unseen phase. So what we're seeing in additively manufactured 75 is not the conventional hardening phase, which is ETA phase, which is MGZN2, but it's actually a zinc copper magnesium phase um, that had no name. So we called it new phase, not because it's brand new, although that would have been funny, but just after the Greek letter uh, for N, uh, new. Um, and this, um, picking up on my last sort of short story, is another stark reminder that even for alloys that we've all been flying in for decades, we don't fully grok the metallurgy, right? So we've all been in an aircraft, or perhaps most of us have, that's been made up of 7075 as the structural material. And if I said to you, you know, when I met you five years ago, guess what? In a few years, we're gonna find a phase that no one knew existed. You probably would have slapped me for good reason. But anyway, pressing on, um, what I did wanna show you here um, is that one cool thing about 3D prints and printed aluminium alloys is the ability to make um, things in net shape. So high strength, lightweight structures in net shape. And what you see here is another example from a student called uh, Abirami Babu um, that designed an aluminium alloy um, with very high solute levels. And the reason why this was possible is was because of the ability to uh, exploit the conditions in selective laser melting. This sort of alloy and this sort of composition wouldn't have been able to be interrogated if one was uh, just using um, conventional ingot metallurgy. So this uh, particular alloy has about 17 weight percent alloying. Um, which you can't do by castings because what it would it would happen is, is this alloy would crack on cooling and it would crack on mass on cooling. Um, and again, what we see here is we see interesting hardening phases um, that again are previously unreported compositions and compositions that don't exist in uh, in CalFAD or, or databases. Um, of unique composition, but also unique structures as well. So in this particular case, not only was there a unique uh, composition, there was a unique structure of a quasi-crystal. Um, the composition and the um, size of, of this particular phase, or the, the, you know, the unit cell um, and the quasi-lattice contents were both different from the new phase. So this was, again, a different phase, um, which we call P phase. We're kind of running out of letters. Um, so we're open to suggestions. Um, but interestingly, um, what you see in this particular net shape structure you saw before the lattice shape is that it does respond to, to heat treatment um, as one may expect when you've got an, an excess of, of solute. Um, and the accompanying TEM here, the micrographs here shows you um, that uh, you, know, you can get a, a very high volume fraction of second phase going on here. This is work in progress. So I haven't shown you the full mechanical workup, but I wanted to show you some of the things in sort of pint sized stories so that you can take away a little bit of aspects of materials design. So that's it for the 3D printed aluminum alloys. So I'm off to my next story now, um, which, is a, which is one that's close to my heart at the moment. This is um, a picture on the left there um, from about a year ago of what I'm now calling a contemporary uh, aluminum alloy foundry, if I may. 
and what it looks like in 2019. So this is a group of students sitting around a table, um, eating pizza and drinking energy drinks and data mining databases and archives and literature for properties and compositions of, of aluminium alloys that are available. And this process never ends, it's ongoing as there's new papers, there's new data and so forth. But this forms the basis of machine learning uh, to grasp uh, the composition uh, processing properties of, of, of aluminium uh, alloys to, to date. Now, hang on a second. I just see a message here in the chat. Ah, okay. I'll get to the questions after. Sorry. All right. Um, of, of uh, yeah, of, of uh, a big database. So these students, um, what they've done, most of them actually are not metallurgists. They've helped create a big database that we've then uh, processed using a machine learning uh, methodology, which is not uncommon. I can jump into some more details later. But the reason why we use machine learning is because I found over the years that aluminium alloy design is actually a very, very complex task. In fact, it's very complex for humans. And it's a design task that has a lot of complexities in remembering things because there's information dropout and extremely high dimensionality. So what I mean by that is when you're designing an aluminium alloy, you have a whole range of inputs. So composition, processing, quenching, and the composition might have more than 10 elements in it. So you've got potentially 20 inputs to generate a strength and a ductility, as example, if they're your key two criteria. So you've got 20 going into two, which is very, very complex for humans to grapple with. It's also very difficult to, uh, to convey that information in someone's head to someone else. So machine learning, um, if it's trained, um, can take the best of the best in terms of expert systems because the data it's fed embodies the individual designers uh, that, have, that have generated those alloys. So I'm not gonna go into those details, but it's not, it hasn't been a simple task because um, there's so many different heat treatments for aluminium alloys that we had to uh, encode um, tempers using a feature vector as to whether alloys were cooled from an elevated temperature, naturally aged and artificially aged and cold work and solution heat treated, so forth. So in order to give a numeric uh, recipe to a computer that it understands for what are non-numeric um, and, and human, human derived inputs. All right. So um, hopefully this is not too boring for those, uh, but I'll get to some metallurgy just in a second, a couple more slides. You're not intended to be able to see what's on the screen. This is meant to be an alphabet soup. So here are some results. Um, if one asks the machine learning to serve as artificial intelligence and select alloys that have a yield strength of 770 megapascals and an elongation of 15%. So this would be quite aspirational. So I don't expect you to read it from there, but I've selected two alloys, alloy one and alloy two, that this artificial intelligence spat out and said, make these and you'll get the properties you want. One had a T6 temper, one had a T7 temper, respectively. And they're quite unique. So we see for alloy one, um, that there's a presence of bismuth, um, high zinc, but also with manganese, uh, magnesium, copper, and other specific additions like silver, chromium, scandium, and this is the same for alloy two that actually has lithium, magnesium, zinc, copper. So things that would cause very chaotic microstructures in terms of co-precipitation, which is extremely poorly understood actually at the, at the human level. So what did we do? We ended up making them um, by students, great students. Um, these don't look like a conventional foundry people. Um, and so they're just, they're just fabulous what students are able to do these days. And here's some of the results. We see here for alloy one, it didn't make it to 770 megapascals, but it made it to 430 megapascals um, and a UTS of 500 MPa with a considerable strain at failure of 8%. So that's a good amount of ductility. The microstructure, as one may expect, um, is quite busy and perhaps that's expected given the production conditions that we used. Um, and you saw what the foundry looked like before and who the foundry people were. Um, alloy two, um, a little bit weaker, but still very interesting. Um, fracture seem premature in both alloys um, and can likely be put down to the, uh, the, the coarse constituents from the alloy blending in-house. But I just want to stop here for a second. What's really amazing um, is that with absolutely no metallurgical expertise, the main research in this, this little uh, snippet of a story here was actually done 
by an undergrad computer science student that you saw in that photo. His name was Alan um, from the Canberra suburbs, right? Um, the alloys were made in-house and the alloys, if you particularly if you look at alloy one, has better properties than anything uh, that was made by any aluminium company for the first hundred years since uh, the inception of age hardening. Um, and those properties, they can't be disputed. So um, they're built on machine learning of, of data that's known and a lot of toil has gone into. But those that, that, that created what you saw here uh, have no idea about aluminium alloy metallurgy whatsoever. Um, all right, so that was recent up until a few months ago up until this week, um, there's another undergrad student at the ANU that's been working on um, turning this into a graphical user interface and a little bit of software that soon we'll be able to share with, with everyone where you can use the software in two ways. You can either put in a composition and a temper um, and hit go and it will tell you what your properties will probably be, or you can do it in reverse like you saw before. Now, the interesting thing is, the model is getting better and better as it's matching, matching you know, the, the real data. You saw before two uh, first attempts of examples um, that didn't meet the 707 uh, megapascals. And I think that's okay. That results then go back into the model and then you, 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 get, you get better and better. All right, so that's the end of that short story. Um, I think this is the second to last one, but they're getting a little bit, a little bit shorter as, as I go. The next short story is going back to, to sort of human made and anthropogenic materials being the embodiment of energy that I started off with. And we see here from a very, very easy pluck of the internet that aluminium smelting, so the Tomago smelter that many of you know, is the largest user of, of, of electricity in, in New South Wales, right? Also in Victoria, the prize goes to Alcoa. So materials um, being a big energy user and, and therefore a big polluter in our country, is something that we've, we've all grown up with. Um, same in, in, uh, in South Australia, they're also electrically challenged. Um, and so therefore, you know, and that's been in the media a lot lately, they've bought a really big battery to try and solve that. But we can't any longer in good conscience or in good practice um, separate our use of anthropogenic materials and the environment, um, including um, the, 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 the fact that the energy produced on earth has a consequence in some way um, or in some other way uh, on the earth. So the example I wanted to give here is one of the biggest bandits for the production of CO2, not so much energy use, but for the production of CO2 um, is, is cement. And cement is the gray stuff, you know, that we, that we see in our concrete um, that along with sand and rocks and water makes up concrete. So the production of cement from high temperature sintering at about 1400 Celsius um, in a kiln in a big kiln, um, has been the biggest single uh, source, the single one point source of CO2 emissions for many, 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 many decades. And so from an engineering perspective now, if you look at this problem, a heck of a lot of concrete is used to create material, just volume that's not load bearing. And it's either simply used to separate space or to serve as a barrier. So to this end, can there not be another solution or some sort of sustainable cement that can take this, the space of the gray stuff in concrete. And so to this end, uh, you know, answers lie often in the, in the darndest of places. Um, here we see an artist and inventor called Phil Ross, um, who's a famous artist actually, in his studio or outside his studio in San Francisco. And he started using mycelium, which to cut a long description short, is a precursor of, of matter uh, prior to mushrooms becoming a fruit. And by using this, he was able to grow mycelium into molds to make furniture. Pretty cool furniture, very expensive, but it's odd looking. But regardless, uh, from a materials point of view, I won't talk about furniture. What I did wanted to say is that uh, this sort of uh, mycelium bricks or products that he was making were stronger than concrete, pound for pound, water resistant and easily composted. So very, very, very interesting. Um, so, Here's a bit of, of, of workflow of how something like this might work. Um, and one can conceive of say, you know, composting waste food as the organic matter food source for mycelium growth. So think about that, you know, half eaten slice of pizza or your leftover bread or something. Um, and that can enter the growth cycle for mycelium to produce bricks. Um, the bricks basically in a mold or briquettes, whatever shapes you want, you, they grow in a mold and they can be have their growth terminated 
um, by slight uh, exposure to elevated temperatures, not very hot, I'm talking about sort of 60 to 80 Celsius for a flash curing. Um, and this, this is really, really interesting. This was tried in the lab by again, another uh, undergraduate student called Chloe Badger um, to make mycelium bricks from potatoes as feedstock. And it was quite successful. Um, it was also covered in the socially aware periodical um, called Matters, which is published here in, in Collingwood in, in Melbourne. So I'm trying to run a bit of a Melbourne theme through all of this. So um, in terms of my short stories, I'm on, I'm on the home stretch now to try and try and keep with time. But I did say before that superconductors are not an area I work in. I probably wish I did. Maybe I will one day. But a superconductor, uh, as I'm sure that many of you know here, is a substance that conducts electricity without resistance when it becomes colder than a critical temperature. So this is not the same of just uh, getting a lower resistance as you go down in temperature, which is generally what metals do. But it means that you lose all of your resistance all at once at a critical temperature. This is actually really interesting because at that point, electrons can freely move the material with no energy barrier. And what that means is it means that your material can become a surface conductor very quickly. And you have this thing known as the Meissner effect where um, you, you can generate these surface currents because there's no resistance and you can repel magnets um, and you can get this levitation effect going on with absolutely no energy input. It's just a feature of the superconducting material and the way that electrons can travel in it that lets you do this. Now, hopefully I don't lose you and, and you're all on mute so you can't swear at me, but this realm of superconductors con being important um, and this phenomenon um, was popularized in science fiction in the movie Avatar some years ago, which was a big blockbuster, where there was an imagined planet, I think it was called Pandora, not sure, not sure where they got these names from, that had naturally occurring superconducting material in part of its ores on this imagined planet. But what that meant is some parts of that planet floated, giving you these wonderful lush gardens. But the really interesting thing, um, which is where I'm going potentially with materials development as, as we move forward, is that uh, this particular property of superconductors that repels magnets or creates some sort of force without actually having to put energy in, um, meant that that was the basis for the thrust for what they call their interstellar commerce and spacefaring civilization. So, um, Given that they, they had these naturally occurring superconductors, which even in that movie, they said they were worth $20 million a kilo unrefined and $40 million a kilo refined, even that amount of room temperature superconductor would be very useful as, for example, a fuel source to get you know, a, a spacecraft to another planet. And so given that we're one teeny planet in the galaxy and the concepts that are now driving um, materials innovation uh, uh, align with an era of where we're uh, embarking on a mission to Mars, um, these aspects do give, give very new meaning to material science and to make it very current. The reason why I'm talking about this now is exactly one week ago, or at least if you factor in uh, time zones, exactly one week ago, uh, the material with the highest accepted uh, superconducting temperature or, or that critical temperature uh, was discovered and it's a carbonaceous sulfur hydride with a critical transition temperature of plus 15 Celsius which is absolutely amazing. The only downside, because mother nature can be quite funny, sometimes a good sense of humor, is that to get this effect, you need to have a pressure of 267 gigapascals, which what that means in real terms is the pressure close to the sort of pressure that you see uh, near the, the, uh, the, the core of the earth. So um, optimistic, but really, really interesting. Um, but thinking about other planets and thinking about all sorts of different things is also um, a good way of, of thinking about where materials trends are going to the future, because what it does is that it breaks uh, the rules and often culture-based rules that we think of in the way in which we design materials. So I'll give you another example from just today, actually from this morning, Australian time, is that this OSIRIS-REx um, spacecraft, um, which is being run by, by NASA, um, uh, went to uh, a, uh, a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> went to an asteroid, which is moving, you know, uh, through the galaxy. 
uh, and collected some, um, some rocks that it's going to bring back to Earth. It's going to take a few years to bring them back um, to Earth. This is not the first time that's been done, getting, getting matter from outside our planet. It's been done before with the Hayabusa mission from, uh, from um, the Japanese. So Professor Kawaguchi, who's actually a, a, a colleague of mine in our college, in the uh, College of Engineering and Computer Science at the ANU, he used to be the head of JAXA, which is Japan's version of, of NASA. Um, led this mission, um, which is a bit like the movie um, Armageddon, where you land on a moving asteroid, collect something, or do something, and then come back to Earth. That's due to land in Australia in a couple of months. So look out for samples returning from Hayabusa. Um, and we may see something very interesting. But space is full of interesting things that we don't really grok on Earth. So a good example that I'll give you, because again, this is very popular now in understanding crystallization of degenerate materials, is some of you have probably heard of white dwarfs, which is what uh, suns turn into, or suns and stars turn into. One thing you may not know, and if you don't know, you can use this at dinner parties and, and maybe make new friends, is that the density of a white dwarf is one billion kilograms per cubic meter, which is just mind boggling, right? And so um, uh, this is because it's comprised of degenerate matter, which means that the energy levels in the constituent atoms are filled up with electrons. So only last year was it then actually determined that crystallization of such matter, not much matter, such matter can actually occur. And this is the sort of stuff um, which uh, is very, very important to understanding and driving, you know, our materials ambition and how we think about materials. And it's exactly the sort of stuff that you're not going to find in your introduction to material science book um, by Callister. So I'm nearly done. I think I've got one or two more slides. Well, this might be the last one. But whilst I'd planned on sort of delivering an ambitious overview in person, I'm here instead going to finish with the importance of stupidity in scientific research. And what I mean by that is not by promoting ignorance by choice. It's the entirely opposite of that. But because of being able, by being stupid um, on certain things, you can then focus your attention on questions that put us in the position, the awkward position of trying to answer unknowns. So the known knowns are not very interesting, right? We all know what happens when you add magnesium to aluminium or vice versa, but it's the unknown unknowns that are very, 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 very interesting. So with that, um, I do want to acknowledge some of the folks that contributed to funding towards some of the, the projects I showed or, or showcased a little bit today, um, including the wonderful machinery at the Monash Center for Electron Microscopy. Um, huge thanks again to Materials Australia. Um, there's no doubt that the Gifkins lecture has been, or just being asked was a career highlight for me, and I'm very humbled to have been given the opportunity. Um, I'm going to stop sharing screen in a second, but I do um, hope that through this process, um, there's an opportunity to connect with some of you, maybe in lockdown, maybe not in lockdown, and continue the dialogue um, for, for you know, some of the topics I've presented here. Now, Ivan, I'm going to have to perhaps unmute you. I think you can probably unmute yourself. I've unmuted myself, but if you Excellent. could also pass the chair back to me, that would be great. I'll do that, then Ivan. Nick, that was a wonderful lecture. It was an absolutely worthy Gifkits lecture. Thank you so much. Places others haven't, uh, which, is, which is great. And it's also what we need to do in Materials Australia now is to keep our metal roots, but also widen <laughs> out to all the rest of the wonderful materials we can be working on. So I'll open uh, our next lecture up for questions. And, Thank um, you, Ivan. I think I've made you the host again. That's good. I'm going to ask one question just so people can think. Um, if we're talking about space travel, mm -hmm. uh, the temperatures in space are really low. So why can't we just use superconducting now? <laughs> it's a really good question. They're low, but the, I don't think they're that low. But that's a really, really good question. Um, I'll have more answers. I've been spending a lot of my spare time getting into superconductors. I don't know if it's a midlife crisis or, some, or just a, a fascination. But um, yeah, the, the, the current superconductors that we have in bulk work at a few Kelvin, which is far too low. No, though you need to be a bit a bit, a bit higher, hotter. Yeah. A but bit not hotter. that much higher. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the, the other question is why can't you have a local heat source near the you know a, a, you know a, a, a local um, source of not heat cooling you know uh, locally as well? But anyway, good question. I like how you've embraced the out there. All right, so. Uh, 
other participants, if you could put your hand up or really if you could just speak now because we, uh, anyone wants to jump in and uh, present a question. I've just stopped sharing so that I can see you all. It's such a pleasure yes. to see so many faces. Well, I might actually show my own face while we're doing this. Um, yeah, for all. Yes. Alan, you have a question. Not a question. I just want to say thanks, Nick, for such a, an entertaining but challenging uh, production. I, I think it's made us sort of uh, think outside the box quite a lot, which is, which is what we need to do. Thank you. So, Nick, I'm not sure if I missed it, but can you tell us why didn't that glass ball fracture? <laughs> you know what? I, I, I wish I knew, Ivan. I wish I knew. Um, so we've started, I've started a research project now with some folks here at the ANU um, in, the, uh, in the School of Physics to try and understand geometry effects on, uh, mm. on mechanical properties um, for amorphous materials. Um, I have to admit, I haven't talked terribly much about some of my, my colleagues at the ANU, but some of them are extremely remarkable in what they can do. And the reason why I'm telling this community here is um, one of the other borders that we need to smash is, I guess, that of jurisdictions, right? So uh, Canberra is actually the next closest city to Melbourne, if you, if you can be kind enough to call it a city or at least pretend it's a city. And, and some of the things going on there in terms of uh, nuclear science, um, tomography and so forth are quite remarkable. And one story, if I can just share for 10 seconds, that's mind boggling is I always had a lot of respect for folks like us that do things like EDX and try and characterize composition of materials. And I now have a number of colleagues um, in the Research School of Earth Sciences, and their job is to determine the composition of other planets, including ones not in our galaxy. Right? And so they're getting specific compositions and structures of things that are not even on this planet. Um, and so um, the eye-opening experience has been quite remarkable. So I'd invite you all to, to uh, you know, uh, put the Australia in Materials Australia when you're thinking and, 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 and reach out to those in, in similar disciplines as well that are doing interesting things that can help you. Uh, Samuel, you had a question. Samuel, we can't hear you. I'm not sure why. Is that better? Yes, much better. Thank you. Sorry. Um, thanks, Nick, for the presentation. Um, yeah, interesting work, and it's exciting that we can start to dabble with uh, new alloys with some insights from these um, machine learning aspects. However, my question would be, like, the advent of, say, glass metal composites or these highly alloyed materials, what's that going to mean for a cycling and refining process? Will that give us new issues we have to deal with? Is the recycling plant of the future going to have an XRF gun scanning every single part as it comes in? Or what? Yeah, it's a really, really good, good, good question, right? So, um, so um, one thing that hasn't even been done properly, I think, in Australia or in, in many countries, is understanding um, the weight, the composition of the waste stream, um, and understanding what is what is actually uh, available in the pantry of waste. So, how much manganese is there? How much silicon is there? How much iron is there? And so forth. Um, I'm not touting only machine learning models, but if you have models that can predict properties um, based on inputs like composition, you could almost start to consider a future where you're uh, tailoring what a commodity material is based on what the waste stream is and really closing that loop. Um, something like that is potentially not terribly far away. Um, the other interesting thing that I didn't want to talk about today because it's a whole five hour presentation is this whole advent of these quirky alloys called high entropy alloys, right? Where you can take uh, compositions that um, that have equiatomic and not necessarily even equiatomic, but have multiple principal elements in them and create uh, useful products. Um, so I think there's a lot of legs left uh, in, in these multi-principal element alloys and high entropy alloys. Some people say, that you know it's all been done before they may not be useful because there's no applications for them yet but what's interesting is that um i see those things as biases right so if someone says there's no application for something it's only because um i guess uh, capitalist companies are not making them in large volumes right because they control the market it doesn't mean that they're they're not worth studying um and so i think there's going to be a whole renaissance in metallurgy owing to the the broader family of high entropy alloys 
Sorry, uh, Sam. Long answer to a short question. <laughs> that's all good. Uh, other questions for Nick? Uh, Nick. <clears throat> Hello, Nick. Nice to see you. Thank G'day, Ian. Very interesting. Tell me, how did you get from this SI04 flower down the bottom of the ocean to your big glass ball? What was the fabrication of that? How was it fabricated? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, 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 basically, where I was going with that, so the SIO4 was in that picture, and I was actually, I've got to confess, hastily preparing these slides where I wanted to actually put a structure of SIO2 as there as well, because there's there's various forms of, of silicon oxides. But what's interesting is at the you know molecular or the atomic level of these Venus uh, Venus as flower baskets, so these deep sea sponges, at the molecular level, they are largely exactly like your window glass. It's just that they uh, exploit a hierarchy of materials. So they've got threads that you then stack up on threads to make bigger threads, and then they're woven, and then they're in specific geometries. So the, 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 the core composition of what you go from the flower basket to the ball, um, I was just trying to demonstrate there that there's geometry effects um, in amorphous materials that we can build up structures, not microstructures, but build up geometric structures um, in, the, in the case of multi-scale material structures um, that can create things that we, we hadn't really thought of before. Now, humans are particularly bad at doing that. Um, um, and the only reason why now these complex structures uh, are accessible to be able to make hierarchical materials and, and multi-scale materials properly is because of computation and things like being able to script directly into CAD programs and what people are calling um, generative design. This is not my area, but I understand that um, it's, a, it's a tremendously important area and one where we're going to see a lot of growth in, in materials um, over the next sort of 10 or 20 years. Hey, uh, we're almost out of time, but we do have a chance for one or two more questions. Um, so please uh, take the opportunity. Um, there's a lot of uh, comments on the chat, Nick. Everybody is uh, extremely happy with the lecture. So uh, have really a look great. before you leave. There's uh, some very, very positive feedback there thanks and well-deserved feedback. Thank you. And look, thanks for having me, uh, Ivan. It's been a real pleasure.